to destroy the works of the evil one and the kingdom of darkness with light and to rescue men from the law of sin this is the gospel of christ to proclaim good news unto the poor the gospel of christ spreading the soul-saving message of jesus and now ben bailey this is the gospel of christ when god said to solomon ask whatever you want and i'll give it to you how wonderful it was to hear Solomon say in 1 Samuel 3, verse 9, Give your servant an understanding heart that I know, may know how to judge between this people. 1 Kings chapter 3, verse number 9. We welcome you today to our study of the book of 1 Kings. As we look to the history of, history of Israel today, I want to encourage you to get your Bible and have it ready as we're going to look to the Word of God to learn some very practical lesson from this time in Israel's history known as 1 Kings. As always, today's lessons are being brought to you by individual members and congregations of the Lord's Church. The Church of Christ in your area would love for you to stop by and visit their assembly, uh, whether it be on Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday evening for Bible study. They'd be happy to have you. You'd be an honored guest at their assembly. And friend, if you've got a Bible question, you'd like to study the Word of God more, you'll find people there who love God, who love His Word, and who are happy to sit down and discuss the truth with you. Also, here at the Gospel of Christ. We'd love to help you in your study of the Word of God. Check out our website, thegospelofchrist.com. From there, you can find all of our video and audio resources available free of charge. We've got audio lessons, video lessons, written material, just a good host of Bible study material to aid you in your study of the Word of God. If you'd like to have a copy of today's lesson or any of our past lessons, they're all available online for download, or we'd be happy to send you a DVD or CD as well. You can go to our media request form from the website, fill that out, and we'd be happy to mail that to you as well. And don't forget from both the Apple, uh, Apple Store and the Google Play Store as well that you can download our app, the Gospel of Christ app, and that's a great way to study the Word of God from your phone as well. Friend, as we think today about the great book of 1 Kings, much of this is going to encompass the reign of Solomon, David's son. And Solomon had so much good, so much potential, started out with the right heart. But things got in Solomon's way and things tempted him to go the wrong way. In the book of 1 Kings, we're mainly dealing with what we refer to as the United Kingdom. Basically, we've got in the book of First and Second Samuel, we've got Saul reigning for 40 years. Then along in Second Samuel, you'll have David who's going to reign for 40 years as well. And then as we turn to First Kings, you now have Solomon who's also going to reign about 40 years. So the United Kingdom is for about 120 years where you have both Judah and Israel, all 12 tribes united together under one earthly king. Then, of course, after that, we will have the divided kingdom as well, and we'll mention more about that later. But we know of Saul, that he was from the tribe of Benjamin. He was a, a big man, head and shoulders above everybody else. But ultimately, as we've studied, God rejected Saul for his disobedience to him. And about chapter 16 forward in 1 Samuel, David begins to be on the increase. He is eventually anointed as king. He just came as a shepherd boy from 1 Samuel 16. Of course, we know one of the great things from David is he slayed that great giant Goliath and he's went on to be discussed as the Bible in the Bible as a man after God's own heart. Acts chapter 13, verse 22. That wasn't to say he was perfect. We studied and saw some of the things that weren't. But friend, after David, Solomon arises. And we're going to notice today that God is going to divinely bless Solomon with wisdom. He's going to have the, the privilege to begin to build the temple, which his father, who was a man of war, was not allowed to do. But ultimately, Solomon 
is also going to be rejected by God because of his sin and the things that he does. But let's notice how his uh, reign begins with a lot of encouragement from his father David, who was a great man of God. I want you to take your Bible and look in 1 Kings chapter 2, and let's listen to some of the things that David says to Solomon in 1 Samuel 2 or 1 Kings 2, verse number 2 following. David is now dying, and he gives this charge to his son Solomon. He says, I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore. And prove yourself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, to keep His statutes, uh, His commandments, His judgments, and His testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do, and wherever you turn, that the Lord may fulfill His word, which He spoke concerning me, saying, if your sons take heed to their way to walk before me in truth with all their heart and with all their soul, he said, you shall not lack a man on the throne of Israel. What is it that got Solomon off to a good start? David, who had some faults, but was looked at as a man of God, gives him some great charges or encouragement. In verse 2, he says, you need to be strong. You need to take a stand. You need to stand for what's right. You need to act like a man, which basically is have the backbone and the spine to, to, to do what's right and to stand up for what's good. And Solomon had that in many ways. You know, this reminds us a lot of the charge that is given to Joshua. In Joshua chapter 1, verses 5 through 9 as well. Be strong and very courageous, God will say to Joshua as well. Then David tells Solomon, you need to be faithful uh, to your God. You need to keep His commandments, walk in His ways, keep His statutes, and do what God says. How we wish that Solomon would have taken those words to heart in many ways. In this area, he did fail in some ways. And then, of course, David tells Solomon, if, if you do what God says, God is always going to keep His promises. Friend, from these words of encouragement to Solomon, given by his father David, we also need the same encouragement in a day and age where it's not always easy to do what God says. When people sometimes look down on the Bible and God's Word, we need the encouragement to be strong, to stand up for what's right, to hold fast to the truth as the New Testament teaches us. We need the encouragement to walk in God's ways and to be faithful until death. Revelation chapter 2 verse 10. And friend, just like God told Solomon that if you do what God says, He'll keep His promises, we need to know the same is true today. God cannot lie. Titus 1 verse 2. The Bible teaches that God will always deliver on His promises and the greatest promise of all, this is the promise He's promised us, eternal life. If we stay strong, if we walk in God's teaching, you can take it to the bank and you can rest assured God is going to bless His people today. Now Solomon initially takes these words to heart and he starts out with such a, a great motivation and a great heart to follow after God. I want you to take your Bible and open with me to 1 Kings chapter 3 and I want you to see that God is now going to approach Solomon and he's going to say to Solomon in essence, you can ask me anything you want. And I'll give it to you. You know, it's not the same, but it kind of reminds us. So someone said, if you had these wishes, what would you ask for? Well, God basically says to Solomon, ask anything and I'll give it to you. You know what Solomon asked for? Wisdom. Look in 1 Samuel or 1 Kings chapter 3. And I want you to notice what the Bible says in 1 Kings 3, beginning in verse number 9. Solomon says, Therefore, Give to your servant an understanding heart to judge your people that I may discern between good and evil for who is able to judge this great people of yours. 
This speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. Then God said to him, Because you have asked for this thing, have not asked for long life for yourself, nor asked riches for yourself, nor asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. Behold, I have done according to your words. See, I have given you a wise and understanding heart, so that there has not been anyone like you before you, nor shall anyone like you arise after you. And, I have also given you what you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be anyone like you among the kings all your days. So if you walk in my ways to keep my statutes, my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will also lengthen your days. Friend, this is, one of, this is probably the peak and the highlight, the, the climax in Solomon's life could have asked for anything and he asked for wisdom why because he realized the seriousness of ruling over God's people friend from this there's a very practical lesson that relates to God's people in the church today to those whom God has appointed in the local congregation to oversee to lead to be shepherds and elders in the local congregation how they need to take a note from the page of Solomon's life and realize it takes wisdom, it takes patience, and it takes a whole lot of selflessness to lead other people. And we need God's blessing. We need God's help. We need to pray for wisdom. Leaders who will pray for wisdom every day. James chapter 1, verse number 5. But along with this idea... God also tells Solomon, because you did ask for the right thing and you weren't selfish about it, I'm going to give you all this other stuff, hoping that having that wisdom, he could deal with it. But friend, there's something that we want to address and point out here, and we mean this with really no disrespect to the good that Solomon did in his life. But friend, all that wisdom in the world is not going to make a person automatically make the right choices. Often think of Solomon as the wisest fool to ever live. He was given divine wisdom from on high. And just about eight chapters later, we see Solomon up on the hilltop worshiping or at least building the idols for his wives and their false gods. What happened between chapter 3 and chapter 11? where Solomon is basically complicit in these things and where he marries these multiple women and gets all caught up in sin. Friend, wisdom alone isn't going to make a person make the right decision. You may know what's right. A person may be able to discern between good and evil, even have that in the practical aspect, but you also have to have the, the determination and the want to and the will to resist temptation and sin and so we see Solomon's great moment here but how that is also overshadowed by what we're going to learn about Solomon in the future now as we look a little further we notice that Solomon also has some great things in that in dedicating building the temple and dedicating that temple Solomon is Look to as one who exalts the power of God and realizes God's place in the people's lives. Look in 1 Samuel chapter 8, and I want you to notice, or excuse me, 1 Kings chapter 8, and I want you to notice what the scripture says, Solomon speaking in this prayer of dedication in verse 22 and 23. Then Solomon stood before the altar of the Lord in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread out his hands toward heaven, and he said, Lord God of Israel, there is no God in heaven above or on earth below like you, who keep your covenant and mercy with your servants, who walk before you with all their hearts. And he goes on in this text to exalt and magnify the power and the might and the faithfulness of Almighty God. He goes on to realize in chapter 8 verse 27 that the temple has its limits and the real power is for God. And friend, as we think about these words and as we will think down the stream of time in Israel's history how we wish they would have realized 
More importantly, what Solomon said here, the power is in God. The power is not in this human edifice. The power is not in buildings and things like that. And yet, as you will look at Israel's history, in Jeremiah chapter 7, verse 4, as they are about to head off into Babylonian captivity, what do they cry out for? They cry out, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord. What are they saying? Save us, O our temple. Sadly, too many times, as people, we put our faith in touchable, tangible, feelable things, rather in the God who made all of that. And that's what Solomon is trying to drive home here. Our faith should not be in church buildings. Our faith should not be in how much money we have or don't have in the bank account. Our faith should not be in military might or power. All of that matters little if God is not at the center. Friend, our faith must be in the all-powerful, almighty, living God who can do far greater than we've ever begun to think or to ask. Put your trust. Here's what the writer in Hebrews says. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not on your own understanding. Proverbs 3 verse 5 and in Hebrews 13 5 the writer says that the Lord will never leave us nor forsake us so that we may boldly say the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Now let's look at another side of Solomon. We know he had great wisdom. We know his heart was right in building and dedicating the temple. But we most likely also know that Solomon went down a wrong path eventually. What happened? How could a man who was so close to God at times, who God even blessed with wisdom from on high, what led to Solomon's downfall? I want you to take your Bible and look with me in 1 Kings chapter 11. Let's begin in verse number 1, and we're going to notice several things that led to his downfall. And the first was Solomon's inability to keep his passions in check. Look in 1 Kings chapter 11, and I want you to notice what the Bible says, beginning in verse number 1. The Bible says, But King Solomon loved many foreign women, as well as the daughters of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, from the nations of whom the Lord had said to the children of Israel, You shall not intermarry with them, nor they with you. Surely they will turn away your hearts after other gods. What happened with Solomon? Like any person, he had natural passions and desires that when put in a proper place are good and holy and right. But Solomon failed to keep those in check. Solomon loved many women. He had a problem with his desire and his passion for other women and, and a multitude of those. And as we're going to read, uh, 300 wives, 700 concubines. Now, friend, I don't mean this at any disrespect at all, but how can anybody with that type of wisdom even contemplate having that many wives and that many concubines. That's just not something God wants of His people. And so His many wives are eventually going to lead Him astray. And you'll notice it wasn't this, that He had many wives. That was not what God wanted either. All the way back to Deuteronomy 17, verse 17, God said to His kings, You shall not multiply wives. And He goes on to mention horses, other things. God didn't want them to have a multiplicity of wives. That was never God's will. And... Not only did he have many wives, he went and entered married with people that God specifically said, don't intermarry with them. These heathen people, these idolaters, they're going to draw you away from God. What's the practical lesson then? Okay, you say that's good and well, and I see how that led to Solomon's downfall, but how does that apply to Christians today? The book of Proverbs says, Rejoice with the wife of your youth. Always be enraptured with her. One man, one woman. That's God's original plan. Genesis 2, verse 24. And a husband and wife are to love one another, to be faithful, not to let one's eye wander, but to be faithful to one's wife. And then, of course, 
we make the encouragement, especially for those who are followers of God, for those who are children of God. Friend, you cannot find any better advice than this. When someone is thinking about marriage, always, always, always marry a faithful child of God. I heard a preacher once say, and I guess it's kind of tongue-in-cheek, but it's still true. He once said this. He said, if a Christian marries a child of the devil, you can be sure he's going to have trouble with his father-in-law. My friend, that's about true. If you marry somebody who's not a Christian, who's not following the teaching of God, who's not following the teaching of the Bible, there's going to be confusion and problems. And while you may win them to the Lord... Friend, let's also realize this, because I've seen it happen way too many times. They may well pull you away from the Lord. Marry a faithful Christian who will help you go to heaven and stay true and faithful to each other. Then, as you look to 1 Kings chapter 11, not only was it the many wives that led Solomon astray, but the many wives and the peer pressure that came from that was also a problem. Look at 1 Kings chapter 11, verse 3. Solomon had 700 wives, princesses, 300 concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it was so, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned his heart after other gods, and his heart was not loyal to the Lord his God, as was the heart of his father David. It wasn't just the many wives. It was the peer pressure from those multiplicity of idolatrous wives of heathen nations that would eventually work him down. It didn't all happen at once, but over time, a little here, a little there, a little giving in here, a little tolerating sin here, a little not standing up for what's right. And before you know it, over and over and over, Solomon has given in to those many wives who turn his heart away from God and through peer pressure or causing him to do things that are not right. Young people especially, we want to encourage you. Find a mate, not only a mate, but find good Christian friends who are going to help you get to heaven. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 31 through 33, evil companions corrupt good morals. Isn't this an illustration of that? Solomon had some of the best morals, some of the best wisdom, some of the right encouragement, instruction, but evil companions, those foreign wives, led him down a wrong path. Choose your friends carefully. Find people who love God. Find a mate who wants to go to heaven. Find people who are going to encourage you to do right and stand up when we don't do the things that are right. Don't give in to the peer pressure to go and do what everybody else is going and doing. And then, of course, these many wives will eventually lead Solomon down a path to idolatry. Look in 1 Kings chapter 11, verse number 5 following. For Solomon, for Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Solomon did evil in the sight of the Lord and did not fully follow the Lord as did his father David. Then Solomon built a high place for Shemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the hill that is east of Jerusalem, and for Molech, the abomination of the people of Ammon. And he did likewise for all his foreign wives who burned incense and sacrificed to their gods. It's almost, it's almost unimaginable the 180 degree turn Solomon takes. In 1 Kings chapter 3, Solomon is on his hands and knees before the throne of God, begging for wisdom to be the kind of king God wants him to be. In chapter 11, he's on the hilltop worshiping false gods. What happened? Gave in a little here. Gave in a little there. Listened to those wives here. Listen to their uh, desires here. Gave in to his passions. Let his flesh and the carnality of it run wild. And before you know it, a man who had wisdom from God is building temples to and worshiping false gods in Jerusalem. Do you see the effect that negative influences can have on our lives? And of course, we're going to begin to see 
this being a problem throughout Israel and their involvement in idolatry and, and things that, that, that go along with that will be the, the history of Israel is plagued with some of the things that started right here. Friend, today we want to offer that encouragement that we find from these practical lessons today, and it's this. Let's make sure that our heart stays true to God. Let's make sure that we stay humble, that we don't think more highly of ourselves than we ought to, that we choose very carefully the kind of people we're going to run around with. You can't underestimate the power of influence that other people will have on us as well. Sure, we ought to be a good influence, but friend, if we're constantly around people who are not Christians or who don't put God first, is that going to affect me in some ways? I heard someone once say this, if you run with the goats, you'll eventually smell like them. Well, friend, I want you to think about that from a practical perspective. If the people that I constantly surround myself with are not Christians or are against Christianity, don't have good morals, and I'm constantly seeing, hearing that, being around that, and feeling the pressure of that, is that going to affect me? Friend, if you think it's not, then you're as foolish as Solomon was. Solomon had wisdom from on high. He didn't make the right choices at times. We've got to realize it's very important who we surround ourselves with. And so to the child of God, to the Christian, choose your friends, choose your mate carefully, find somebody who will help you to go to heaven. And as always, we make the encouragement, let's strive each one of us to live our lives in such a way that we will honor and uplift and magnify the name of God in every way. We want our lives to be a light to the world, Matthew 5, verse 16. And we want to do good so that all men can see Christ living in us. How is God being viewed in our life? Are we walking and living faithfully according to the teaching of the Bible? If not, then make changes. But if so, don't ever give up fighting the good fight and don't think Satan's not trying. Keep your armor up, stay faithful, stay true to God. That's the lesson from 1 Kings. You may have just joined our program and are wondering, what is the Gospel of Christ? The Gospel of Christ is an evangelistic work of the Churches of Christ that reaches the whole world with the Gospel through TV, radio, and Internet. Our motto is to take the whole Gospel to the whole world. We believe in having a book, chapter, and verse for everything we say and do. And unlike many religious groups today, we're concerned about lost souls, not your wife. This is the Gospel of Christ. We encourage you to visit thegospelofchrist.com for a host of Bible study material, well as audio and video copies of our lessons. If you would like to have a copy of today's lesson, please visit our website and fill out a media request form. Or you can email us at mail at thegospelofchrist.com. Call us toll free at one 855 458-3905 or write to us at P.O. Box 788 McMinnville, Tennessee 37111 the Gospel of Christ